there we are now. Welcome. We have not met in quite a while, so uh, I hope we are back into our AAC mode. Uh, I am, as always, your chair, Andrew Taylor, and I'd like to start the meeting at 4.04 p.m. Okay. The Halifax Regional Municipality is located in Mahi, the ancestral and traditional lands of the Mi'kmaq people. The municipality acknowledges the peace and friendship treaties signed in this territory and recognizes that we are all creative people. So we will begin with our roll call. Liz, do you have, can you see your interpreters? No, I can't. Just kidding. I'm fine. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. A um, little bit of humor on a Monday is always a good thing. Uh, Miss Mahoney, are you here? Hi, uh, Chairman Andrew. I am here. I, unfortunately, I am in, well, I guess fortunately, um, I am at uh, a car dealership having some service done to my car. It's just an oil change. So I am here. Um, and they said they will be down around five o'clock. So I can only stay until then. If that's, I actually, I'll, I'll hang out here until the meeting's over because they close at six. All right. You are here. That's what matters. Yes. Nicole. You, yes. Nicole, are you here? I'm here. Excellent. Jackie, are you here? Uh, chair, uh, Sorry, this is a, the clerk here. Uh, Jackie has not yet um, entered the meeting. Okay. We have regrets from Jordan. So Jordan is not here. Kristen, are you here? I'm here. Excellent. Uh, Rochelle. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Excellent. Councillor Digo Gammon, are you here? Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Yes, here and all ready to go. Good afternoon, Councillor. Councillor Purdy, are you here? Hello, Mr. Chair and everyone. Yes, I am. Excellent. And Councillor Russell, are you here with us? I am here as well from uh, sunny Sackville. It's a great day to be here. Thank you. Always a nice day in Sackville, sir. All right. We have three sets of minutes to approve. Uh, I presume they have all been circulated. If that is still the case. Thank you, Chair. All the minutes have been circulated for today's meeting. Excellent. So we will address the October 24th uh, minutes. I presume we've read them and I will be uh, entertaining any wish, any additions or deletions you wish to make. Hearing none, can I call for a motion to approve the October 24th minutes as circulated? So moved, Mr. Chair. Thank you, I'll Council. Second. Councilor Gammon. And I'll second. 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 And who is Purdy. this? Councilor Purdy. Excellent. So, all in favor? Or do we need a, a favor? Yes, we do. My 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 rules of order are rusty, so pardon me. So, do we need a a motion, Clerk? Thank you, Chair. Um, I would suggest that for this item, uh, unless any of the members have uh, um, like amendments that they would like to make to any of the uh, to any of the minutes, that they could yeah. all be moved together for approval. All right, great. So, if you have viewed all three minutes and have any uh, additions, deletions, corrections to be made, uh, please present them now. Otherwise, I will. Uh, can I apply the mover and seconder to the new vote? As long as the mover and seconder are comfortable with that, absolutely. Councilors, are you Mr. okay Chair. with that? Absolutely, Mr. Chair. Yes. Excellent. Thank, thank you very much. So I will uh, I will move forward. All have been uh, seconded. And uh, now, <laughs> forgive me, Annie, but... Uh, can you knock me back into the rules of order, please? 
No worries. Uh, through you, Chair, so the, the motion has been moved and seconded, and now uh, the Chair could call for uh, the question on the motion. All right. Can I have a call for the question, please? Question. All in favor of approving these three batches of motions, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion has carried. Thank you for that. Um, the order of business, do we have any corrections, additions, or deletions to the order of order of business? Sorry. Thank you, Chair. Um, through you to the committee, there has been no request for additions or deletions for today's agenda to the clerk's office. Okay. Uh, then I will ask for a mover for the motion that the uh, order of business be approved. This is Rochelle. I'll uh, I'll move that that be approved. Thank you, Rochelle. Can I have a second? I can second. All right. Thank you. Uh, call for the question. Question. Uh, all in favor of approving the order of business, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. We have no business arising from the minutes. So I will call for a uh, declaration of a conflict of interest. Do we have any conflicts, Clerk? Thank you, Chair. And uh, this, uh, if should any members have a declaration uh, or a conflict to declare, they can do so at this time. But uh, nothing, nothing uh, sent along to the clerk's office ahead of time. Excellent. So we will proceed then. Consideration of deferred business. We have none. Uh, Clerk, do we have any correspondence? Thank you, Chair. Uh, there's no correspondence uh, nor petitions received for today's meeting no from the petition. clerk's office. And no presentations. So we will move on to uh, straight through to staff report on the meeting schedule. Uh, that would be, has that been circulated? Or uh, that be presented by you today? Thank you, Chair. Uh, so this uh, item has been circulated uh, to the committee uh, for, for approval. Okay. So have we all looked at the uh, meeting for the coming calendar year? Are there any uh, red flags, if you will, for that schedule? Uh, Chair, it's your, I believe uh, Councillor Degel Gaiman has their hand up. Okay, my apologies. Councillor. No, that's okay, Mr. Chair. I was just going to put the motion on the floor for you. All right, thank you. Can I have a seconder for that motion? So uh, the motion being that the Accessibility Advisory Committee approve the proposed 2023 Accessibility Advisory Committee schedule as circulated. Second that, Councillor Russell. Thank you, Councillor Russell. Call for the question. Question. All those in favor of accepting the motion that the Accessibility Advisory Committee approve the 2023 meeting schedule as circulated, please say aye or raise your hand. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. Thank you very much. Now we are moving on to the Government Relations and External Affairs presentation. Uh, my cursor has locked. <laughs> Therefore, it must be Monday. Hello, everybody. I am yes. Connor Obey. I'm a policy yes. advisor with Government Relations and External Affairs. I am here with my colleague, Fatima Faraz, to present to you on uh, a proposed engagement with uh, Research Nova Scotia and Engage Nova Scotia, which I think will be of uh, pretty deep interest to the Accessibility Advisory Committee. And I promise to give this short and sweet because I am primarily, and we are primarily interested in feedback from you as well as your blessing to come back and report to you on how we're doing. Um, Annie's gonna run the presentation for me. And uh, if it's okay with you, Annie, I'll just say slide ahead when we're ready to go. Does that sound okay? Sounds great, thank you. Perfect. Okay. 
if you want to let me know. And that's oh, perfect. All right. So let's move to the first slide. Uh, so, excuse me. This is uh, Liz. I just, I'm not able to see the interpreter. One second. Okay, I can see them now. Perfect, thank you for letting me know. Okay, so what we have been asked to do, so the, the, these are motions that are stemming out of both Regional Council and CPED, uh, so Community Planning and, uh, and Economic Development. Uh, we've been asked to look at partnership opportunities with two specific groups that are deeply engaged with uh, research issues across Nova Scotia, and we're looking at that in the Halifax Regional Municipality context. So, the first of those is Research Nova Scotia, and the second is Engage. So next slide, please. Now, these have come from two different council bodies, but what we're proposing to do is both at once. And the reason why is that one can help us undertake the generation of questions that are appropriate and projects that are appropriate to changing the Halifax landscape. And the other is actually really particularly well positioned to validate the, both the potential value and impact of the research over time. So what we wanna do is work with Research Nova Scotia first to look at what we should be doing and the questions that we should be asking. And then on the back end, we'll be working with Engage Nova Scotia to say, have these things and these interventions that we've undertaken over the course of this pilot uh, been useful and have they seen actual sort of change in the public good, in public perception, public well-being? So I'm going to hand it over to uh, Fatima for the next couple of slides, and then I will close at the very end. Okay, so I will shut myself off now and hand it over to her. Thank you. Thank you, Connor. Uh, who are no Research Nova Scotia? Research Nova Scotia is a nonprofit and government funded organization. It supports and promotes research and innovation in the province of Nova Scotia. It encourages collaboration between different stakeholders. Uh, it provides funding for research projects in different wider range of areas, for example, health sciences, um, social sciences, engineering, and also the natural sciences. It supports the government uh, for the development of a vibrant and sustainable research community. Next slide, please. And uh, how does Research Nova Scotia work? It brings together stakeholders from different uh, parts of the I mean, community. For example, researchers, governments, uh, organizations, and uh, universities. It provides the resources to conduct research for infrastructure research, for example, including uh, some of the lab equipment or building the development of the research. It advances innovation and it commercialized ideas uh, to um, bring some products to the market and it aims to drive economic growth and enhance the quality of life. Next slide, please. Who are Engage Nova Scotia and how does Engage Nova Scotia work? It is again another organization, it's a nonprofit organization. It is government funded. It fosters collaboration, creativity, innovation in communities throughout the province of Nova Scotia. It identifies challenges and opportunities for research in the community. It promotes a culture of engagement between the different stakeholders. It builds uh, and brings uh, the, the, the diverse perspectives and sectors. Next slide, please. And over to you, Connor. So what we are proposing in terms of working together is a pilot research project. So we have one year to take a look at this. We want to uh, basically strike a working group, uh, which is going to be led by government relations in HRM, so government relations, external affairs, which is our group, and then Research Nova Scotia, the director of research, will be primarily doing this. There'll be a, a back end communication with the folks from Engage Nova Scotia to look at how we're planning out the data preparation and how we're going to validate what we're doing at the end of the day. Next slide, please. 
So what do we need from you? And this is, anyway, just wanted to say, I'm delighted to be able to have the opportunity to speak to you about this. There are so many important things that can come from the Accessibility Advisory Committee on this. Um, I have to say that what we are proposing as this first year pilot is actually inspired by the work that I've done with Melissa over time, which is the frustration that we've seen about increasing things like accessibility in terms of uh, navigating uh, within uh, federal and provincial legislation and looking at better ways of collaborating to get things done for communities uh, and working through all those different complexities. So on that particular pitch, what we are looking at is uh, a, a, a significant amount of research around how different levels of government can work more collaboratively together. So that's in terms of vision, approaches, and different mechanisms. So we're going to be looking basically across the world, jurisdictional research, and look at how that type of mechanism might be able, because it's being done in a lot of different places now, like how you work from regional, federal, and municipal levels. And it's, it's something that I think the councillors on the call can also resonate with. This is something that we would really like to move forward with in terms of a proactive and uh, more streamlined approach to getting things done. So understanding that change involves all these different levels of authority. How can we really make change at most effectively in a most timely manner by working together with all these different levels of government? Again, the hope is that this pilot will morph into a longer term partnership, and then we'll be able to tackle a broader range of questions in coming years. So taking this as the one year pilot opportunity, what we're hoping is this mechanism that we're looking at building, like three levels of government working together effectively, we can tackle a broader set, set of questions. So my our other ask, other than what other ideas would you like to see us looking at is coming back to you to validate what we're working on uh, present sort of a, you know, uh, a, 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 an update on where we are and how we've moved forward, but then continually ask you for what you would like to see done in terms of research questions that you'd like to see us answer, pose, and validate with Research Nova Scotia and Engage Nova Scotia on a go-forward basis. Next slide, please. And just to say again, thank you very much. Looking forward to talking to you about this. And that, that's it for the presentation. And um, any questions that you might have, any ideas that you might have, we are deeply open to. And, um, and again, very excited and appreciative of uh, the capacity to be here and talk to you about it. Thank you, Connor and Fatima for that presentation. Uh, let's start those valuable questions. I will have uh, Kristen start us off. If you had any time to suggest or think of any questions, Kristen. Hi, it's Kristen. Um, I'm not overly clear um, exactly what the intention is. So is it just that looking into how to better collaborate with different levels of government like I just I don't see the application and I might have missed something and um anyways that's my question yeah for sure so um the idea is to look very generally at better mechanisms for getting legislative and operational coordination between these three levels of government so one of the things that we continually find things like accessible taxi accessible buildings there's a misfit between what the municipality would like to do and some of the things that are posed by the conflict even between federal and provincial legislation. So by looking at the way that these three levels of government can work better together, we're hoping to get things done more quickly in a whole bunch of areas. And the reason why I've mentioned accessibility is it's because something that when I was uh, working with buildings and compliance, Melissa and I had looked at, and you know, uh, the charter doesn't allow us, for example, to, um, uh, subsidize accessible taxis. So that's one of the things that we looked at years ago, but it's really looking at the best coordination. So we're not getting caught up in legislative regulatory conflict and we're getting stuff done as quickly as possible and as efficiently as possible for different communities. That was very helpful. Thank you. It's Kristen also. Uh, thank you, Kristen. Uh, Rochelle, do you have any questions or input? Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, and thank you for that presentation. Uh, I think my main question is like, do you have um, like a, an idea of how much time this will take to get this sort of research project going? Um, and then how long it'll take to actually implement some of the ideas that will come up? I know like broadly, how long you expect it to take? 
No, that's an excellent question. So given the fact that it's a, a one-year pilot, I'm hoping to bring something back to this group a, a, as well as uh, women's advisory and youth advisory within, I would think, three to four months to say, this is our first step and then keep you know, go, coming back to you quarterly to say, this is where we are with things. Particularly because if this gets traction with council, counselors on the call can speak to this, it means that the idea generation for future research questions, it's gonna rely deeply on the advisory committees uh, because we can go from this high level question of how do we work better with other levels of government to very specific pilot projects on what is the best practice for dealing with this particular issue. So quick turnaround, gonna be a very lean project and we will be able to report on stuff very quickly back to you and solicit your feedback again. Thank you. All right, Councillor Digo Gammon, do you have any questions for Connor or Fatima? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it. Um, thank you, Connor. Thank you, Fatima, for the uh, presentation. I guess I think back to our um, accessibility town hall and what our community spoke to us. And the, it seemed to me that you know there were three themes in the town hall, and uh, one of them was accessibility and housing. Um, homelessness and and those specifically, I guess, women with disabilities who are precariously housed. And so, you know, I wonder because there are some things around the administrative order within HRM, you know, that we can help with the rapid housing initiative, but that federal has very particular criteria around it. And then we need the province to come in. And so that's all three levels of government, but I'm, I'm wondering if there's a research project there that we can find out where all three levels of government have done some really interesting work around inclusive, accessible, affordable housing. Uh, all together, you know, and then because it also involves the Department of Health sometimes, uh, you know, social services. So when I think back about our town hall, um, I think I heard that the most. The second was just around uh, employability and the third was um, public transit and just uh, mobility, uh, how you move in the municipality. Um, so, you know, we, we've got the, the new accessible taxis and, um, you know, Accessibus, we're talking about the transit app. They were talking about different um, mechanisms around the transit app that would be uh, more user-friendly for people with disabilities. So. Um, if I was to pick one, I think I would pick the affordability and housing as a really good place to maybe do some some good work on all three levels of government. But that would be that would be my take for the moment. Yeah, those are all three amazing ideas. I like you. For me, the 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 issue of housing precarity is because actually, again, Melissa and I were just on the affordable housing committee working through the RHI stuff for the city, the rapid housing initiative stuff for the city and getting better aligned on that stuff. Uh, Councilor, it's, it, it's even about having a better sense publicly and sharing what we can to committees like the Accessibility Advisory Committee about these are the different ways that different levels of government are doing this. So we're sort of opening uh, the box of how these things work together and uh, some knowledge translation issues there are really important, but that I think is an amazing idea and it would give us the ability because we're, we're, we're deeply, as I, I think the, the, the folks around the council table are, are aware, uh, we're so engaged with public safety, uh, looking at this stuff in a, in a, in a, in a, in, from a public safety lens, from a social policy lens, uh, and that means we're deeply working with the uh, Department of Justice, with addictions and mental health, and working with Department of Community Services. And there's so many yep. good chances for integration here, particularly around housing precarity, and particularly around the specific groups that you're talking about in terms of the intersectional marginalization that happens for women with disabilities. So I, I think that that's Sorry, that's just my enthusiasm coming across. I think it's an incredibly important thing that I think that that's that's exactly where we could lean in on in a uh, in a sort of deepening the 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 research angle. Yay! <laughs> I love your enthusiasm. Thank you, Connor. Thank, thank you. Yes, thank you, Connor. Uh, Councillor Purdy, do you have any input? On thank Connor you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and. Uh, Connor, uh, for your um, insight into this. So basically what Councillor Daigle Gammon said, I was making notes just from the minutes that we read today from the town hall, and those were the 
the big issues, the um, affordable, accessible housing. Uh, and so this research project, just, I guess, to clarify for my own sake, it's to help make ways where there are no ways right now for the municipality to put in place certain policies that are not allowed right now because of the legislation in the province and the, the federal government that kind of prevent us from being able to do to do these things is is that what this research committee is is looking to do like um to change legislation i guess is that to, to enable yeah, I think that's a really important part of, so it is, it has a regulatory modernization aspect to it. And Fatima can speak more to that from her particular remit. It's looking at like what actually works within legislation and what doesn't, but it's also looking at how to connect better generally with different levels of government. So if there is a regulatory or legislative misalignment, is there a way to get around that that doesn't involve amendments to regulation? Is there a better way to interpret and work within the structures that have been posed to get the folks that are most deeply affected by this legislation even from a positive or negative manner to change their life for the better to improve their quality of life by having those deeper connections with funding sources with oversight with infrastructure with all those different ways of actually opening up those doors but to your point it is sort of that notion of like how can we solve things more quickly and more adeptly legislatively okay. sure non-legislatively where possible Okay, so on that note, then um, the the well, Councillor Daigle Gammon already said this, but from the town hall, transportation was a big issue as well, and so maybe like funding sources for, uh, you know, because this comes from taxpayers' money from the municipal, you know, um, tax base. Uh, but so a funding source from another level of government would be really, really helpful. Like, for example, some of the comp some of the suggestions to help make transportation easier um, would be uh, to make conventional transit free for those who use Accessibus to be able to free up spots in the Accessibus if, if that's possible, because so that would take a little bit of money. Um, also free parking for those with accessible parking passes like if that's if that's possible that that would help so they don't have to use a pay station and so that also requires some funding um and the other thing too that came up is like for example sign size sizes the the signs on construction sites that are impeding the walkway or or the wheel you know for wheelchairs that kind of jut into the right away of the sidewalks and how big they are. And if there could be, and I guess this is the provincial thing, they, they determine how big the si sign sizes are for this, but maybe in, in the urban um, context, could the sign sizes be smaller because you don't need to see it from, you know, on a highway, you know, far away, you're, you're driving slower on a city street. So like just things like that, that could possibly make life a little easier and um, not have to go through all the red tape of things that just don't make sense if they don't need to be that way. So- Love that, yeah. That, that those are just of, the things, yeah. Yeah, there's a ton of really interesting tactical ways to really improve things very quickly around those ideas as well. And, and again, I'm hoping that this creates a what I'm calling a corridor between us and the province, particularly to have these conversations on a whole bunch of issues. Again, having the power of Research Nova Scotia, because they're connected to every university in Nova Scotia, looking at the best practice around the world to say, okay, provincial counterparts, not, neither of us are experts on international best practice on say accessibility, but we have experts that can inform the way that we're moving ahead in this particular area. And this yeah. is the way to do it. Okay, excellent. Those were my little things that I wrote down. So thanks. That's awesome. Excellent. Councillor Russell, do you have any input on this presentation? I do. Thank you. Um, Connor, you had mentioned that this would be considering federal, regional, and municipal, um, and looking at best practices around. And, and yet we have Research Nova Scotia and Engage Nova Scotia listed as, as partners, but 
we don't have Research Canada or Engage Canada. Is, is the federal government, uh, is some aspect from that going to be included? Um, thing one. Thing two, are we actually going to be able to influence policy at the provincial and federal level? Um, and how long might that take? Will it be in keeping with what we're seeing here? Because they will have to consider uh, what happens all across their jurisdiction. Uh, thing three, if we have to change legislation, that is a years long process, at least as far as the federal government goes and the, the provincial government is, is uh, quite a bit faster. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering on the, me on the mechanics, on the logistics of it at that level, as of, of, will they be able to move, are they willing to move um, based on this project? The hope is yes. So to answer your first question first. So we haven't spoken to the National Research Council about this. They're a little bit of a different body in the fact that like Research Nova Scotia is relatively small, extremely lean, and it's more of like a broker for knowledge relationships, whereas NRC is huge and does all kinds of things. But it's all to say that this could open the door for conversations with them around this. And I think that that's a very important pivot that we could give here. Um, in terms of the capacity for change. I I think you know me well enough to know that I remain relentlessly optimistic about the potential of any work like this to potentially change the dialogue and tone of that dialogue moving forward. So my hope is that what we see from this research project in terms of best practices around the world, uh, in terms of the way that governments can collaborate effectively and how we can take things that are working in the Halifax context and do them pan-provincially, like in different regional municipalities. So you're actually getting economies of scale around research and, uh, and, and uh, implementation of this work. I think that there is a capacity to change some of the pathways or open up more pathways for better collaboration. Uh, in terms of legislative change, difficult question. Very difficult question, but it is. It is I think that there, there's a possibility for opening more doors around that stuff. The more that we are collaborating at every different level, uh, bureaucratically, politically, and and looking at this stuff in terms of specific projects as well. So, I guess we'll see as well what comes from this research in terms of what's proposed around the world. Like you know, what did the Finnish do in terms of regional, uh, national collaboration with cities? Uh, what do they do in Ecuador, for example? But you know, it, it will be interesting to see what the possibilities are and the potentials that lie ahead. Absolutely. Has the federal government been approached and have they responded? Not to date, no. So we haven't spoken to the National Research Council or the feds on this particular issue because it's really been, it, the motion that came from way originally, from Councillor Mason originally, was to engage with Research Nova Scotia. So that would be a bootstrap or a higher level of this uh, in terms of the, the, the bigger engagement. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Liz, do you have any comments or questions on this initiative? Uh, so, something was mentioned about signs. I think it was Councillor Purdy. I missed something about the signs. If we could just go back for a second. Uh, what would reducing the size be for? If we could just add. Mr. Chair, do you want me to? Absolutely, yes, please. So, what the concern was is the side the signage sizes are so big so when they post like construction or on on like a telephone pole the corners of the sign um jut into the the walkway or the sidewalk so for a visually impaired person um the 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 cane or the dog don't necessarily see the the jet so we've I guess had some unfortunate cases where folks will walk into the sign and need stitches or you know hurt the side of their face um there was also something about signage on stands where just just the size of signage this is fairly new to me but I know I, I believe that the issue is because it's a provincial legislated 
thing. The signs need to be a certain size, no matter if they're in the city or if they're on the highway. So it was just suggested that perhaps this could be changed so that in an urban core setting, the signage doesn't have to be so big. So it wouldn't necessarily jet into the sidewalk, for example. So someone in a wheelchair or someone walking who is visually impaired would not see it or not be able to get by. So that was, I know, I know some of our HRM staff are kind of working with folks in the provincial government to see if this is something that could possibly be changed from a legislative point of view. But if there is ways to help with communication and help with uh, aligning of priorities, that would be fantastic. Does Thank you. Help? Yes, yes, that makes okay. it much more clear. Yes, okay. thank you for that. You're Especially welcome. with the, uh, for the people with different uh, disabilities. Uh, my only concern uh, would be the drivers. If we make them too small, then they wouldn't be able to see them. Well, and that's, of course, is right. So what's the, what is the perfect balance there? So, yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, and similar to like the directions and the regular street signs, the sizing on those, I mean, even some of those are pretty small. Sometimes you're driving up to a street sign and you're like, where am I? Is this the one I have to turn on? I don't know. So you're right. It is all about balance. Uh, but also fonts. If we used clearer fonts so that things would be more clear from farther away. It's a challenge. Okay. Right. Do you have anything else, Liz, or is that end of thought? Okay. Yep, one second. Just Chicken here. Okay. Don't want to cut Liz off or anything. Mm -hmm. Yep, I'm all good. Yep. Okay, excellent. Ms. Mahoney, are you able to contribute or are you still having your car serviced? Hi, sorry. I'm just listening to everybody's comments. I can't really talk, right? I'm so sorry. Um, I'm just listening, if that's okay. No, good presentation. I'm still trying to wrap my head around, um, you know, I'm just listening to what everybody's saying and um, like there's so much work to do and there's so much, um, I don't know. I just, I, I get really mixed up on where do we start and where, you know, where, where do we go from here? And, you know, there's been so, there's so much research um, done and it's, and it's when, when does the work start? Right. You know, I sit on a couple of different committees. I'm, I'm currently the very new, um, brand new job uh, as accessibility officer at the University of King's College. And, um, you know, it's, it's, thank you. Um, it's very, um, you know, I'm learning that and uh, well, creating it as I go. And, and, you know, I just see so many ways of collaborating with this too. And, and uh, yeah, so you now it's not really a big comment, but all input is valuable at some level. All right. Nicole, do you have anything to ask Connor or Fatima? Uh, no, not at this time. Thank you. Okay. And Jackie, thank you for joining us. Jackie, do you have anything to uh, continue? First, Mr. Chair, I'm, I do apologize for being late joining. I somehow couldn't get hooked up. Um, Connor and Fatima, thank you very much for 
uh, it's a very informative presentation. And I worked with the provincial government for 38 years and in the area of persons with disabilities. So my head's doing this as you're talking and we could do this, you could do that, you could do something else because I'm very optimistic even at my uh, senior years and all the experience I've put in. I do have a couple of comments of things you might wanna think about. One for me and through my career and as a parent of two children with disabilities, that whole definition of what a disability is from the UN convention to the federal government for, for taxes, to the federal government for uh, student loan, to the provincial government for student loan, to your municipal government. Nobody has a consistent definition. And that is something I think needs to be very seriously considered. Um, and just as a very quick example, my oldest son was born with an amniotic band syndrome. He only has six and a half fingers. And he had applied through um, CRA and was seen as a person with disability. Five years later, I mean, they're wanting him to re-register as somebody with a disability. My response to them would have been, I'm not a lobster, I don't grow fingers. So <laughs> it's that very um, negative and punitive kinds of things that come out of it. But even in my work life, so many times that was a huge issue. Um, the other thing I think that needs to be considered and I was one of those folks, I do live in the city now, but I lived in a rural area when I first joined this committee. Um, very happy to see the council had approved uh, some eventual sidewalks in some of the rural areas. But as you talk and as we talk as a committee, many times it doesn't apply to the rural area in the form it's in. You need an alternate, you need to accommodate <laughs> the, the rural areas because there's many people that live in rural areas that have disabilities and many who are very isolated. They don't have the streets, they don't have the transportation, they don't have, they don't have and have learned to live with it. But there's a real, um, to me, there's a real issue. You're part of the same H HRM, we're part of the same municipality. Um, and I guess a question, before I get to the question, I just want to talk a little bit, sorry, about changes with legislation. Yes, that takes a long, long time. The Homes and Special Care Act was written in 1963. You still have Department of Health and Community Services, both working off the same legislation, and they run very different programs. Um, a lot of that happened when the Canada Assistance Plan was taken away back in, I believe it was the 80s, and none of the other legislation that connected to it were updated or looked at. It was just money taken away from the, the feds, and there was no more Canada Assistance Plan. So the province and the municipalities had to kind of go on their own with that. Uh, the other thing is, a minister can overrule any of the legislation for short periods of time. They can give a special dissertation. Um, the last thing I have is just a question is, has there been cl any collaboration done with the Department of Justice in relation to the Disability Act? Um, it initially was with Department of Community Services. I worked on that project until it was handed over to to um, justice, but I'm just thinking there needs to be some connect there. T too many times over the years, and as somebody referred to earlier, there is so many things going on, and I think Michelle referred to it as well. And it's just, even working in that system, you get boggled because there's so many little pieces happening, but I just think that any kind of research, and I'm familiar with, the companies doing the research and many things over the years I'd been involved with with them. Um, I think there needs to be some connect with Department of Justice, just so that they're aware that there are things going on. And one very last comment is you may want to connect with the um, 
Kings Municipality. I know they've done a lot of work within their municipal unit for persons with disabilities. I think much of it has been in relation to folks with physical disabilities, but it may be a good connect for you because I know that they've done a lot of work around that. Thank you. And thank you again for the presentation. Thank you. I just want to respond to uh, the comments first. I love that definitional thing, Jackie. It's uh, like, it, so, so you we were talking about misalignment between different pieces of legislation and regulation. Affordability and accessibility are two great examples that if they are, they are enshrined differently in pieces of law, they don't work. And we know that people have a very, vastly different understanding of what accessible means to one person versus another. And it has to for a variety of reasons. And affordability is another one. It brings us back to Councillor Deagle Gammon's notion of, you know, folks that are, uh, you know, experiencing housing precarity, uh, particularly uh, in, in a gendered sense and, and folks with disabilities. It just makes this that definitional alignment so important and so fundamental to getting things done. Um, the second piece is, I love that notion of uh, the discretion of the minister, because one of the things that we have been talking about is regulatory bravery and the notion that you could pilot something and get away from slippery slope arguments and say, we have a limited time to try something different. We'll have very careful you know, parameters around it, but let's see what it does in terms of improving people's lives or not. And that's where Engage Nova Scotia can be incredibly useful as well. Um, we haven't spoken to DOJ specifically on this issue. We are tied in very deeply with them on the public safety piece. So I will I will definitely be bringing some of these ideas to colleagues and allies that we've built within there to, to talk about this. Uh, because the more that we tie all these different things together, you know, in terms of uh, mental health uh, response, um, housing, um, accessibility, and, and we're talking, we're getting folks at the, and, and you would know this very well, but we're getting folks at the provincial level to talk across their own boundaries and their own silos as well, because they, you know, don't always have the capacity to do it because they get isolated mm -hmm. in their own work. There's a huge opportunity for creating more collaboration at the provincial level as well as between the province and the municipality. So thank you, all the super exciting comments, and they, those things make total sense to me. So thank you very much. Okay, thank, thank you, Connor, and thank you, Fatima, for that presentation, and uh, best of luck on the project as it goes forward. So now thank we will move much. on to, now we move on to Stephen Cushing, talking about the park lighting strategy. Mr. Cushing is a landscape architect, and uh, Mr. Cushing, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. Uh, Annie, do you want me to share it or um, the presentation or, or would you like me to share? No worries, Stephen, I can uh, take care of that on my end. Perfect. All right, so thank you uh, for the introduction. Uh, as uh, mentioned by the chair, my name is Stephen Cushing, uh, a landscape architect in Parks and Recreation Policy and Planning. And I'm here this evening to introduce the park lighting strategy it's a strategy that we're, uh, we're just in the beginning of the planning process. So um, we wanted to get in here and, and speak with you uh, as a committee to help us influence what the strategy might, uh, might look like. So I'm really looking forward to uh, your thoughts when we get near uh, the end of the presentation. And next slide, please. So to give you an idea of where this um, project is coming from, we're working from a motion of regional council that came to us in uh, June 2021, where a regional council asked us to um, report back to them on what it would take to develop a strategy with, with three considerations in it. So the need to uh, consider policy changes for the, uh, the use of parks after dark. We know that parks have an open and closed hour. Um, around, um, some potential conditions or criteria that would help us prioritize which parks should have lighting and also a capital program for park upgrades. Next slide, please. So we responded to that original motion this past summer where we created a scoping report for what we believed would uh, be required to develop this strategy. So we responded to those conditions within the original motion, but we also um, organized our report and a potential strategy 
strategy into three different scenarios, which I'll get into, but that's primarily walkway or pathway lighting, uh, park facility lighting, and decorative and placemaking lighting. Next slide, please. To give you uh, just a little background into our park network, because that'll influence you know, this strategy, there's more than 900 parks within the municipality. We're a very large uh, regional municipality, as you know. Um, so those 900 plus parks are spread out over that urban, suburban, rural spectrum, where there are a number of different park needs or a number of different park settings and conditions and uh, spacing between parks. So we know that it's not going to be a one size fits all strategy that there's a number of different uh, approaches that we'll have to consider. We do know though that parks are used for recreation and leisure, but they're also hubs um, for social socialization, they're social realms, and they can be the main travel routes between communities and through communities. So currently there's no formal process that we have in place to evaluate where park lighting might occur. It's really a state of good repair. So replacing what's already in place or um, based, you know, a project to project basis where uh, if there happens to be money available, then it might be considered. Next slide, please. So these are the three different lighting scenarios. Uh, there's three photos on the screen here. The photo on the left is illustrating uh, a park pathway that's illuminated at nighttime. And so there's a, num a number of different pathway situations in parks. The priority will likely be those pathways that are the main connection routes between home, between transit, between leisure, shopping, and that kind of thing. We also have multi-use pathways for active transportation where we have a number of different requests. Uh, the photo in the middle, that's highlighting park facilities. So in this case, it's a tourism and a cultural facility within a park in Dartmouth. This is Star Park. Um, but park facility could be other supporting structures in a park, a washroom, a gazebo, a pavilion, or it could also include some um, sport courts or other active um, uses. And then the last photo I have is illustrating uh, placemaking and decorative lighting. That's the lighting above and beyond what it takes to move through a park on a um, pathway. That's the lighting that might encourage people to gather, linger a little bit, socialize. Um, and so in this case, the photo is illustrating trees with up lighting and some seasonal lighting. Next slide, please. To give you an idea of, of some of the project contributors to date, we're just um, you know a, a few months into this project, but um, working with my parks and recreation colleagues, um, the policy and planning group that I sit in. So looking at park planning and the, the bigger picture strategic thinking with our, our team that is building facilities within parks, that would be the team who would be physically building or implementing lighting if that were to occur. And then parks operation, those, those groups who are maintaining infrastructure once it's in uh, parks. We've had some good conversations with um, diversity and inclusion in the public safety office as well about um, what it means to be planning parks through a gender equity lens and making sure that a number of people are um, contributing to this project and um, looking at integrating alternative, more contemporary ways of evaluating um, park safety. So the women's safety safety assessment is one tool that is becoming um, more common for evaluating space and we'll um, hopefully be incorporating some of those principles and how we're evaluating a space before lighting might be implemented into it. Um, we've looped interactive transportation colleagues from Public Works because we do have active transportation multi-use pathways that travel through parks that are important um, connections facility design and construction, because we do have buildings that are built in parks, whether it's community facilities or washrooms or things like that. And then we'll be looping in our environment and climate change colleagues um, when it comes to energy efficiency and using the best products possible. Um, quickly, just some of our external uh, contributors are business improvement districts, because they seem to be um, the most prominent group rolling out um, 
uh, placemaking lighting, seasonal lighting within parks and other public spaces. We've connected with Build Nova Scotia because of the waterfront planning program and the incorporation of lighting into those spaces. We'll be connecting with the Center for Education because we have schools that are physically located within parks, but also parks can become the main travel routes between school and home. And, you know, during the winter and shoulder seasons, it may be dark when kids and families are going to and from those facilities. Uh, we'll be looping back with RCMP and um, regional police, um, especially when we getting when we get into evaluating um, spaces for safety and lighting. And then lastly, in the, the next few weeks, we'll be um, it, um, rolling out a Shape Your City uh, engagement page with a survey um, and other means of, of communicating with us to um, gauge the public's response to um, uh, park use after dark. Next slide, please. So that was a long-winded uh, way to get to the tentative <laughs> agenda, which was really an informal um, discussion. And, and by informal, I mean, we're, we're not seeking um, a motion or recommendation to executive standing committee or regional council because we're already working from a motion. We really wanted to kind of gain your insights as a committee and uh, as individuals with, with your own life experience to kind of help us shape um, um, the strategy. And I have a couple of questions that we can get into. Um, I'll also note that our motion that we're responding to is very specific towards lighting um, within parks. So I know we'll, there's always something that we can uh, talk about, about the physical condition that can Im improve uh, accessibility, um, but we'll have to um, kind of talk about lighting or keep the conversation related to lighting, even though I know it is tied to other um, components of parks. Um, next slide, please. So these are three questions that I had uh, included in the presentation um, to uh, inform a discussion, but we're certainly not limited to these. And um, if there's something that comes up later, we can you, we can also get communications to me if, if we don't kind of get through everything. But the three things that I thought could, or questions that I could thought could um, direct conversation is, how should lighting uh, for improved visibility and accessibility look and feel in a park? And perhaps there's some really good examples and really bad examples that we may want to uh, identify, whether it's here in HRM or maybe it's from another place that uh, you visited. And also because we have so many parks, um, how should we be prioritizing uh, lighting? Uh, in that staff report from last summer, we did have some potential criteria that was a first flush. Maybe there's more and, and you know, perhaps it's uh, creating a wait, a waiting to kind of show that one space is maybe more important or maybe not more important, but should uh, lighting should be rolled out uh, first. Next slide, please. And, and before we get into those questions, I just wanted to give you an idea of where we're going with this. Um, the, the next stage is to kind of go out to the public, see how lighting can make park spaces safer and more enjoyable after dark from a number of different lenses. Um, we'll continue to meet with those internal and external contributors. Uh, we'll be initiating a process um, to look at the parks bylaw P600 respecting nighttime use um, to see what you know the liability, the legal implications are to changing hours of use, and, or you know is there a need to change those hours, open hours? And then lastly, in about a year's time, we'll be reporting back to regional council uh, with a staff report and a completed strategy. We might go back one slide, <laughs> Annie, and I'm not sure if we'll want to leave those up on the screen or if uh, um, or if uh, the committee has those. But uh, that's the, the end of my presentation. Thank you, Stephen, for that presentation. So Thank let's you. Begin, let's begin the uh, questions period. Kristen, would you like to start us off? Comments on Stephen's presentation. Yeah, it's Kristen. Um, I don't necessarily have a question about the content, just kind of a reflection of one of the questions on the slide. Um, just specifically, one of the really important things um, for uh, kind of mobility wise is lighting of the physical path itself. Um, a lot of times there's like dim lighting so you can see where you're going, um, but 
even on like sidewalks and HRM, some of the lighting isn't bright enough that you can actually see physical issues on the ground. But for me, like one rock at a place, if I'm not paying attention or one very, very small pothole that I can't see because it's dimly lit um, means I am like out of my chair on the butt on the ground. Um, so it's kind of one of those things of it needs to be bright. I would prefer more bright places than like, or sorry, less bright spaces um, versus like a bunch of parks that are dimly lit that you can I know, only kind of see. Um, but other than that, that's kind of it. Thanks. Okay. Through you, Thank Mr. You Chair. Yeah. Oh. Nope. We're good, Chair. Thanks. Through, uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for uh, those comments. And um, we're still very early in the process, but but those are really good comments uh, as we get into maybe what fixture design should look like. What, um, how can we space lighting better within parks to to illuminate illuminate those travel ways so you have that consistent lighting. The the trouble in the in you know street lighting is is very high up in the sky so it illuminates a very large area and so park lighting would have to be more pedestrian scaled so it does give you that consistent travel way so you can see you know that um, that travel way without gaps and so you can actually judge depth as well so that's those are really good points and I appreciate that okay Rochelle do you have any uh, con co questions or comments on yeah, sorry. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. And thank you for that presentation. I'm sort of formulating my thoughts as I think them into words. So this might be a messy wording. Um, I was just reflecting back on something you said about like other, maybe it was stakeholder groups you were talking about, and there was something specific um, that you said about like, like women's safety network. And I was just thinking about how, like, obviously there is very good reason to include uh, women's safety network in planning around like park safety um, and, you know, how much or how little it has to do with lighting. I have no idea. That is not my area of expertise. That's why you do that, uh, that role. Um, but I am just, um, you know, this is sort of a comment to keep in mind other uh, marginalized groups who would also be affected by like, you know, the general idea of like safety in parks, whether that's like queer and trans folks, especially with like, you know, hate crimes that are going on all around us and things like that. Uh, people who are like visibly racialized, um, you know, like how you're just, I don't know, I guess it's a question, but more so like a, a thought just, you know, keeping in mind how you're reaching other marginalized groups who tend to be, you know, put in vulnerable situations through, you know, whether it be like darkness in the parks or, or things like that. Through you, Mr. Chair, thank you so much, um, Rochelle, for that. Um, yeah, I didn't spend too much time describing it because I, I might do a disservice to the Public Safety Office for that program that they're using. It's called the Women's Safety Assessment, assessment, but it's also inclusive of you know racialized groups, gender diverse populations, and groups traditionally left out of public space planning. And so it's um, quite a diverse group of volunteers that are involved with um, evaluating space, in including staff and police. And um, before those assessments were were only really done by say the police who were going in through maybe a very particular lens to evaluate public space safety. Um, I know it's a much more fulsome uh, evaluation than I can do it justice uh, in this moment, but uh, definitely points taken um, for being more uh, equitable in that space planning. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Diego Gammon, do you have any input? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Always have input <laughs> or an idea. If you ask me, I'm going to answer. Um, thank you very much for the presentation, um, Stephen. I appreciate it. Um, the, the first comment with uh, Kristen kind of went right to the crux of what I was going to say, which is really around um, the fixture design and specific design for different spaces. 
I don't have a lived experience about moving uh, throughout HRM as a person with a disability. Um, I have supported persons with disabilities for about 40 years uh, in my uh, work in life. And so I, I do know that sometimes what what would come back to me would be, I wish the light was lower, right? So that you've got stuff on the pole lights. People were talking about, you know, it, it, is there a, would there ever be a way that, you know, some of the lighting around accessibility could be lower, like where you need to see it kind of thing. Um, so especially around pathways and parks and park entrances, um, stuff like that. So that that was one thing. Recently, we just got a copy, uh, just released the playing field strategy. And in that, there is a guidance around lighting. And we all know that around the sports fields, okay. stuff like that, usually the sports field is connected to a park or to a trail. And so there's a, a lot happening there. So I wonder if there will be a connection around parks and rec where the playing fields uh, lighting strategy is. Because I know there, there was a, I think a guidance towards more urban lit fields. And uh, again, this is a place where I would say one size don't, doesn't fit all. So in the question about should there be criteria or weighting, I believe that there should be. But I also feel that when we look at the rural experience, how you would put criteria there should be considered a little bit differently um, because then you're, you're, not, you're not in a place where people are using you know, as much public transit or um, excessive bus will only go so far, like a thousand meters from a bus stop. So, you know, whenever anybody's looking at that and they're getting into, out to, into a parking lot. So what does that parking lot, lot at a trailhead uh, look like if it's an accessible trail, those kinds of things. So I think that we have to really look at that and what, what disability lens is then applied uh, to that kind of um, lighting. When it comes to the placemaking and decorative lighting, I learned an amazing lesson with CNIB once around the uh, unintended consequences of placemaking and decorative lighting um, that actually is a disservice to some persons. So no expert on that one at all, but I, I would say connecting with CNIB as one of the stakeholders, stakeholders would be a, a good thing to do. Um, there was one other question that you had there that I thought, well, that's a really good question. Um, did the decorative lighting, I lost it. It'll come back to me, uh, Stephen, or I'll send an email afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Purdy, you are next on my list. Thank you, you Mr. Perry. Chair. And uh, Councillor Daigle Gammon, the questions are in the chat there. So if you want to look at the, the right there. So if you, if you. No, no, I just, I couldn't remember my question. <laughs> oh, your question. Okay. Perfect. Well, that has nothing to do with the questions in the chat then. So, so basically the only thing I thought of when I went over this presentation beforehand was the same thing that uh, Kristen and Councillor Daigle Gammon said too. I was wondering if the lighting could be like closer to the ground for the, that pathway walkway lighting that would help mitigate the light pollution risk you know to you know homeowners that happen to be around it the prioritization should be the connections you know between you know transit and communities and uh you, you know um uh commercial areas grocery stores things like that where folks uh, could be walking at night um and making sure the pathways and walkways are free from potholes. I mean, that's not part of the lighting strategy, but that is a big consideration. And it should feel safe. The, the lighting should feel safe. So uh, now it was said, you know, like darker lighting, it, it might be nicer for a uh, ambiance, but uh, sometimes if it's too dark, there's, there's a, a lack of feeling of security there. So I yeah, know there's a lot to consider because light pollution is a thing too, right? You can't be, um, so good, um, good questions. That's my little input. 
Mr. Chair, I might just uh, jump in really quickly not to take too much time. Those are really, really great points and connecting um, to you, Councillor, uh, and, and um, Viggo Gammon before you. Um, ideally through the strategy, we'll have some high level design guidelines to go with the strategy. So um, to make sure that, you know, if we're, if we're looking at pathway lighting, that it's pedestrian scaled, it's not too high up, that it's downward directed. Um, so you're illuminating the travel way and not into people's eyes. So that glare, that light trespass, that light pollution, those are all the things that we'll, we'll want to avoid. There's some situations where it's really difficult to to avoid, like uh, Councillor Diggle Gammon mentioned the uh, playing field strategy. So this this is a separate. The lighting strategy is will be separate from the playing field strategy. The playing field strategy will look at those purpose built facilities like all weather turf, or you know those very specific diamonds where you have the big uh, light standards where it is really difficult to control the light trespass in those situations. We may look at a different kind of lighting for say a smaller sport facility where it can be lower down, more directed, but the priority where it will likely be those pathways where we have more pedestrian scale, the controlled um, lighting. Yeah. Excellent. Councillor Russell, do you have anything you'd like to address? A uh, little bit, thank you. Um, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm I'm sure that other people have have done this, and I'm wondering if there, uh, this is going to be a little bit of an aside. I'm wondering if if it would make sense to have a, a jurisdictional scan of of what other places are doing in relation to this, but also look at uh, Rick Hansen certification. Um, the little bit of an aside is I don't have uh, any training, and I haven't sought it out in uh, the Rick Hansen certification. So, so I'm wondering if that is something that this group would endeavor to uh, consider for, well, for the future at some point, uh, ju just uh, reviewing that as a group. Um, but uh, Stephen, I'd appreciate it if you could take the both of those into consideration when you're looking at it. When you're talking about lowering lighting down, one of the challenges is it then is within reach and if someone is looking to um, strike it if someone is lo looking to commit vandal uh, vandalism or something like that then it becomes far easier um, we have uh, trails around here where they have taken some of the trail counters some of the pedestrian counters and mounted them really high so that you can't get to them um, in, in other areas, we have lights that are mounted high and they, are, and they become targets, uh, so throwing rocks or whatever. Uh, so please take the vandalism uh, into consideration when you're considering the light design. Um, I'm thinking about the change in terrain. So the pathways have been talked about, but where one pathway transitions into another. Uh, and there might be steps, there might be a, a, a change in the, uh, in the surface structure, there might be something that is different that would introduce that difficulty. Uh, a, make sure that that's really highlighted. Uh, B, uh, make sure that the surface itself has high contrast uh, so that that change becomes incredibly obvious. I've seen examples of stairs, for example, where the pattern of the stairs makes it near impossible to distinguish the edge of one stair from the edge of the next. And even And, uh, and, and an able-bodied person, uh, an able-sighted person would have difficulty navigating that, let alone anybody who had any, any sort of sight difficulty. Um, so looking at that contrast, please, uh, please make sure that the materials that are used have higher contrast and that they don't conflict with uh, low-level issues, with uh, color blindness, with things like that. And I guess that would be my points. Thank you. Okay. Councillor, I'm oh, sorry. Thank you, Councillor Russell. Liz, do you have any comments on the uh, lighting strategy? Okay. Yeah, it's a little hard to explain, but I do have, you know, I'm sure all of us have experienced this before, but um, 
you know, uh, you know, those old fashioned lights, it's, uh, they're, they're quite large and, and, um, you know, they they cover a lot of area with light and then they change them to, I, I forget what they look like exactly, but it's, it's quite different. And it's almost like disorienting how different it is. It's hard to see with the newer ones. Um, it's almost like there's a reduced surface covered with light. Um, yeah, I just, I, I've noticed that sometimes it's almost like um, the new design makes, like limits how much light comes out of it compared to the old fashioned models. So I guess that's something to consider. Um, you know, it, it wasn't, you know, and then maybe thinking about um, like anti-glare possibly because sometimes there are lights that are, are quite harsh on the eyes I've noticed that when I I've been walking outside before um so uh I'm curious are there parks open 24 hours uh because I find that most of them are closed after a certain time uh usually when the sun goes at uh down or um at dusk they usually close I'm curious are there any parks that are open overnight as well Mr. Chair, most of our parks are uh, open from 5 a.m. till 10 p.m. <clears throat> unless it's otherwise posted. There's some like, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Point Pleasant uh, who have a that have a later closing time. This right. exercise, part of it will be evaluating if if we should be changing some of the open hours, especially if it's a really important connection through a park that doesn't really make sense to close because people have to use it 24/7 potentially if people have alternate schedules. Um, it's also the question of shoulder seasons where, you know, at, in, in November at, at 4.30 or 5, if, if people are out, you know, p.m. and a.m., if people are out uh, and need to use a park, will lighting, that additional lighting help park use, even though it is within those open hours? Right. And, you know, most of us um, avoid going uh, to, through the parks at night because it is quite dangerous, um, you know, for a myriad of reasons. So we try to go around where or, or navigate a more safer way. But yeah. And that's it for me. Are you OK? Thank you, Liz, for your comments. Miss Mahoney, I see you've been floating in and out. Have you? Uh, yeah, can you hear anything? me? Okay? Can you guys hear me yes, okay? Can. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I'm, I'm driving. I kind of got the, you know, I was kind of taking up space at the car dealership. So I'm now driving, but it's bumper to bumper on uh, Windmill Road. So hopefully I'll be able to stay with you and you guys can hear me okay. But um, to counsel Russell's um, point, I have the Rick Hansen Foundation certification, and I learned so much about parks. And, um, you know, the, I mean, I, I think this is a really important topic, um, especially, uh, especially what I, I know we're talking about lighting, but, but, you know, you need good lighting to be able to determine and distinguish between the, um, the uh, change of level uh, or, you know, the, the, uh, if one pathway, like he, like you said, uh, if one path, pathway ends to a new one, like, you know, it, it should be a seamless uh, uh, transition. Um, and also, uh, you know, park benches, having park benches, um, like every, you know, 30, I think it's 30 feet. Um, I could be wrong. I'm I deal at everything in millimeters, so I get I get I get these things so mixed up. But but um, I learned so much with that course just about parks alone, and it's really uh, you know that the change of level of of walking uh, as a person with a disability. Like I can really you know I could speak to that. I could speak to uh, you know different trails I've been on. Um, some are good, some are bad. Um, you know, and I know we're really concentrating on the lighting and stuff, but, but 
but I just wanted to uh, to share that point as well. So I hope that's okay. Yeah, those are uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Those are really great points, uh, uh, Michelle. Thank you for those. Yeah, thank you. And if you ever want to, you know, tap into anything that I've, you know, that I've done, um, you know, I'm very happy to to assist or to uh, look look over anything or, you know, get together and, and meet and chat about things like this. So, yeah. Yeah, that's a great offer. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Michelle. Nicole, do you have any comments on the presentation? Uh, I have a few comments and questions. Um, I'm just getting up the questions here. Um, I uh, actually, um, I haven't really thought about lighting uh, in parks because I don't go in parks a lot, but uh, I don't have an issue with with lighting with parks. The only issue I guess I would have is uh, the same as Kristen, you know, lighting to see, I would try to avoid puzzles or puzzles. Um, um, so my wheelchair doesn't go through them and then I drag water or mud everywhere. Um, so those that's the only um, issue I would have with lighting and why lighting would be uh, important to me. Um, the most reasons I don't go in parks is because if it's gravel, if it's uh, high gravel, uh, it depends how high the gravel is. Um, I'm not really sure how, um, like what the best option would be um, accessibility wise for parks. Um, I don't have a weekend and um, sort of the certification or any formal training. Uh, I wish I did, but uh, I am a past weekend and ambassador, so I would really uh, um, encourage you to talk with them, see if they have any. I'm sure they have uh, useful uh, tips and also the CNIB. Uh, because I feel like lighting is mostly an issue for people with um, visual impairments. Uh, the only visual impairment I really have is my depth perception is uh, off. So if there's like a decline or incline and the path isn't really uh, well lit, then, um, then that's kind of an issue. But uh, yeah, because um, I'm a wheelchair user, um, the uh, one specific lighting uh, situation uh, that I've thought of while listening to everybody is, it's actually not a park, it's at the uh, uh, Bayes Cove, the, um, the um, viewing deck, the new viewing deck, because uh, people were saying how lighting could be closer and I was didn't think that would make a difference, but uh, thinking about it more, it does make a difference. You know, the closer the light is to something, the more lit up it is. So like maybe pod lights or something to like, to mark where, they, where the path is. And so uh, maybe if lights are like close to the ground, maybe it would uh, light up, uh, puddles or puddles or little dippets here and there of uh, where they are in the path. Um, and uh, what's the third question? Bugs be prioritized. Um, I'm not sure how um, they would be prioritized, but like I'm, I guess the most like the popular ones like public, public gardens um, or Point Pleasant Park, that's the only, those are, Point Pleasant Park is usually the only park I go on because it's, the gravel there is not that bad in Point Pleasant Park as well. Um, I, I did have a, a question, like, uh, if 
you implement lighting and bugs like um and let's say for public gardens for example public gardens closes at night so my question was if we do uh, implement lighting uh does this mean like the uh, the hours would increase or like what's the hope with um implementing lighting in parks Through you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, it's going to be very situation specific. I, th I think the hope is that we'd be able to light, um, well, one idea is anyway, to prioritize the those pathways that are essential to get to point A and B first it is one idea, rather mm -hmm. than the public gardens where you don't necessarily, because they're closed, you don't necessarily take right. that route as an essential connection. Yeah. Same with Point Pleasant Park, where after dark, you really, there is no A to B, you yeah. know what I mean? Um, and, and so it, we know that this will take so, quite some time for these pathways and situations to be lit just because it would have to come forward in annual budgets and there's only so much capacity. So, you know, which pathway that's a priority between A and B is is the question. You, you raised a good point about um, park use and you know knowing how many people are actually using pathways and parks I think that's potentially a good step to in helping us prioritize um, so that was a really good point and I really liked your comments about the Peggy's Cove viewing deck as well uh, yeah they have cool. the, the lights yeah. that are like the um, you know guiding the path kind of yeah it's also a good way to help prevent um, like sky glow and light pollution yeah. if you're putting your light really close. So I'll have to take a closer look at how they design that and maybe that's something we could incorporate into our design guidelines. Yeah, they built it into the ground somehow. So maybe mm -hmm. plot lights like in a garden, to, yeah. like a like a one light kind of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's cool, thank you. Thank you. Jackie, do you have anything you'd like to be heard on? Yes, a couple comments through you, Mr. Chair. Stephen, thank you for the presentation. Um, just to quickly go through the questions, the improved visibility and accessibility look and feel like. As uh, Councillor Dago Gammon mentioned, I do not have the lived experience from that perspective of a person with a physical disability. However, just from a human perspective, it needs to look and feel safe for people. Um, and that safety is a number of issues, um, not just that somebody may assault you, but safety in other areas as well. Uh, specific lighting situations, I'm not familiar with any in particular. Um, the prioritization, and I see that Kirsten had sent a message um, on chat saying around areas that have already been, in, I'm sorry, that's a, a dog that just woke up, um, around areas where folks with disabilities use those facilities. And I would agree that those should be the priority. Um, what I did like in initial presentation you had was you talked about the rural areas. And again, as Councillor Dago Gammon mentioned, there's a different criteria there. I can see the parks in the rural areas specifically being used for social kinds of gatherings. So having said that, I see a lot of that related to youth in the rural areas. You may want to consider youth groups when you're reaching out to folks. Um, not that every youth is <laughs> gonna lead to any kind of vandalism, but as Councillor Walker was chatting, um, I certainly understood what he was saying and that certainly could be an issue, but the whole social area for the youth and the young adults is certainly a priority in the parks in the rural areas. Thank you, and I'll tell my dog to stop barking now.
through you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much for those comments. Um, you know, I, I agree with 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 what you said, and and though that's some good takeaways for us to to dig into. Thank you. All right. That concludes our question round. Thank you, Stephen, for your presentation. Um, we will move on to the committee members. Uh, I believe we have we do not have any. Is that correct, Annie? Thank you, Chair. And there is nothing for this agenda item today. Uh, no staff items or updates. Thank you, Chair. And uh, nothing on that end either. Okay, so the date of the next meeting is, as indicated on the schedule, drum roll please, I do not have my schedule in front of me. So. Uh, Chair, it is March 20th. Oh, sorry March if 20th. I, yeah. Thank you very much, Clark, for your, keeping me on my toes um, today and well, every month. Um, so March 20th is our next meeting. So with that in mind, can I have a motion to adjourn today's meeting? Oh, uh, Chair, I'm sorry, this is the clerk again. I believe we have two potential comments from my counselor, Deco Gammon and uh, Rochelle. All right, counselor Gammon, Deco Gammon, do you have? Oh, thank input? you so very much, Chair. Um, I wasn't quick enough. I was clicking on chat instead of raise hand. Oh my goodness. Oh. Um, oh, well. I just I just wanted to share with the group that, you know, one of the, the conversations probably after the town hall uh, that came up was a um, from the community was a request to think about the voluntary um, vulnerable persons uh, registry. And I just want to let the committee know that that motion did go forward to council um, and that there will be a staff report coming uh, forward at regional council to look at the possibility of a vulnerable persons uh, voluntary registry. So just as an update, thanks. That's great news. Rochelle, did you have something you want to bring forward? Yeah, um, and I'm not sure if this is like the right time or place to ask about this or request this, um, but I tried to send an email somewhere a couple months ago and nothing happened. So I was like, I'll just bring it up here where I already am. Um, I would like to, I don't know, formally request that we, uh, as a committee, if this is the thing to do, um, have a presentation from city council or like HRM council, I can't even remember which one it is, about the proposed budget cuts that they're um, talking about these days. Uh, they seem to really deeply affect um, a lot of marginalized communities uh, and several of the proposed cuts specifically uh, would affect disabled um, communities. So I am looking for, you know, how can we as a committee contribute to some of that decision making? Because, um, yeah, I just haven't got like a, a clear understanding of how that can happen. And it feels like something this committee should maybe be a part of. So, yeah, I don't know if this is the right place to ask it, um, but I see that um, Councillor Russell said can speak to it a little bit so yeah councillor russell you have a response absolutely uh so the budget process is unfortunately terribly complex it is one of those things that the new cao and i have been talking about making it more simple there uh let me see now where to start with it um let, let's start with what we have seen as a cost increase across the board for everybody in HRM and Nova Scotia and Canada and stretches farther along. So the, the CPI, the, the cost of living has gone up about seven or 8% for all of us. And the initial budget that, or the initial suggestion that came from staff is that we increase everybody's property tax by 8% so that we would be able to cover that. It wouldn't be an increase in service, it would be an increase in tax of 8% to maintain the same service. Um, and council said, no, we can't do that. Uh, so council said, let's look at 4% instead. And we need to look at what it will take to only increase the property tax by 4%. And this, this is the tax that you would pay. 
has nothing to do with the tax rate or the, or the assessment. It is the, the combination of those two uh, that forms the tax that you would pay. And so it would be an increase in that amount. So we, we went back to staff and we said, we don't want to increase it by 8%. We only want to increase it by 4%. What are some suggestions? Everything is on the table. List everything that you might consider for us to look at as far as a way that we can get down to a 4% tax. And so staff went back and they did that. And they brought back uh, suggestions of, of what we could look at to say, you, you could include um, increasing transit fares, for example. Uh, you could, you, you could uh, look at, we're, we're talking about transit on in two days. Uh, you could look at uh, reducing the transit amount, the, uh, the, the amount of transit that we have uh, permanently by 5%. And that would be a way to save money. You can increase fees and that would be a way not to save money, but to earn more money um, by increasing uh, building permit fees uh, or by having Sunday parking, Saturday parking, evening parking. It's a way to bring more money into the budget. Now, these things are not things that council has discussed um, or some of them are not. Some of them are things that council ha has discussed. But these are suggestions from staff and council will look at each one of them and either consider it or not. And we do this on a business unit basis. So we're talking about transit and fire on Wednesday. We're talk we have already talked about police. We've already talked about parks and planning and all of the other departments. When we look at these individual items, um, me as a counselor can add them to a list for consideration. And then we will look at them when we have a, a more full picture of what the budget is going to look like. That'll happen at the end of March. The list that we're seeing is not a list that has been decided upon. It's not a list that we have already discussed generally speaking. Um, it is a list of suggestions that we could look at that staff have already considered. As we have gone through this, each of them relates to a business unit. If we've looked at that business unit, then it's behind us. And if we have not looked at that business unit yet, then it is ahead of us. Uh, so we have added some of them to this thing called the budget adjustment list that we'll be looking at at the end of March. Some of them we haven't. No final decision has been made on it yet. That'll happen at that end of March meeting, which we'll cover a couple of days. Um, what else? If you're looking to have a direct input on the budget, then you could certainly do that here. Uh, we also have uh, an open budget process in that at the beginning of every budget meeting, the public is allowed to come and make presentations. You're allowed to you, you can come and you can speak to the budget committee for five minutes, um, either on the topic of, of the day or on some other thing related to the budget. And, and you would be speaking to all of council. I hope that covers a lot of it. It's not everything related to the budget process, but I hope it, it takes care of that list. Sort of. I mean, I, I have like a, a you know, I, I don't feel as like emergency. Yeah. Things are getting cut and we have no say in it as people. Um, but I, I do, you know, I, I do want to point out like for individuals to come and speak at a council meeting to have to show up because they're not hybrid and they're not online, they're in person. And that's very yeah. difficult for a lot of people to do. Um, and, you know, just the fact that it it really puts the onus on the individual. And in my mind, I'm like, well, what's the point of this committee if we're putting the onus for advocacy on individual people. And so I guess my sort of follow-up question, and I don't know if like there's other hands up, so happy to, you know, shut up and let other people talk. Um, but is there is there a way that like this committee and other, I mean, if they're interested, other um, committees who are sort of made up to represent and advocate for these populations, um, like how can we as a committee get involved in this decision-making process? 
Um, because it kind of feels like that is why we exist versus placing specific responsibility and onus on individual people to show up to a meeting that they might not be able to get to anyways and have like, there aren't a lot of accessible options um, and then have to like say their own thing, which would probably make the meeting more lengthy anyways. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my thought process and, and questions and I'll, there's other hands up and I have a feeling that other people will oh. have some similar feelings, so I'll let other people talk. That, that's fair. Uh, there are three specific points that you mentioned that I would like to address, if I may, Mr. Chair. Sure. Thank you. Uh, the first one was uh, consideration for an online meeting or a hybrid meeting. Um, over the past number of years, we have had all online meetings. That will exclude a certain population. Uh, those who are not comfortable with technology. Nowadays, we have an in-person meeting that will exclude a certain portion of the population who uh, are not comfortable or who, who are not able or there are travel restrictions or whatever. The hybrid option is something that we are looking at. Uh, back in June, I uh, asked for a report on implementing uh, a hybrid meeting and that should be coming to council shortly. Um, thing two is how can you get in touch if you're not uh, going to be coming to the committee, uh, get in touch with the individual counselors. Uh, all of our email addresses and phone numbers are listed on the website. And so, um, you would be able to get in touch with us individually if you're not comfortable, uh, making a presentation at council. And the third point I forget. Oh, how can we as a committee do it? This is a committee, it's an advisory committee of council. Uh, this committee provides advice on forward-looking policy, on things that are coming up, on how we can uh, do a thing better. Um, it is, there is not a mechanism at this point for this committee to make uh, a recommendation in the budget process to affect the individual counselors or to, to uh, provide direction in that way. So the best way for you to do it is to reach out to those of us who are on the call here or all of council individually as you choose with the alternative being come down to council and you're more than, uh, more than welcome to, uh, to present to us. Uh, Mr. Chair. Councillor Dago Gammon. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm the chair of the other meeting. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, um, yeah, anyway, yes, Councillor uh, Dago Gammon. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks, Paul, for, for the good explanation and stuff. And thank you, Kristen and Rochelle, for sending emails. I, I don't know who they went to to get an answer, but uh, happy to respond to them if you want to do that. I do think that we can make this an agenda item on our committee. We've got a, a really nice work plan. And in terms of education and awareness and where what's the connection between this committee and how HRM actually works and we work via a budget. So um, I think between Annie and um, you know our esteemed chair, um, but we should be able to look at that work plan and figure out where in the work plan we'll be able to, to structure having someone from HRM actually come and discuss exactly what uh, the linkages are and uh, education and awareness. Um, Annie, did I overstate uh, just how awesome you are at looking at that agenda and, and making something happen with us? Uh, thank you, Councillor, through the chair uh, for pumping my tires. Really appreciate that. Uh, but um, no, certainly this is something that we can put on, on the agenda, whether it be a part of the work plan for for the coming year um or is it like a standard you know discussion throughout the budgeting process because it is quite lengthy unfortunately we are coming to the latter end of it now it kind of starts in november and goes until the end of march early april um but i did just want to note um that there within the duties of this committee um Section 6E outlines that this committee has the duty to advise council on disability issues that may have an impact on the budget on the budget planning process through the uh, budget uh, committee of the whole process. Yep. So um, there's certainly room to explore exactly what that looks like. Um, 
in in the past, I think I have seen kind of uh, not not explicit like recommendations that you know council might see that you know um, develop like staff reports, but it would uh, be something potentially where committee members um, could agree to like the text of like a letter. Um, outlining uh, concerns or outlining particularly budget items that they um, would like to see that meeting space prioritized um, that would be then sent along as correspondence on behalf of the committee through that kind of advocacy role. So that is that is one avenue. Um, and certainly, like, like I said, you know, we, we are getting kind of closer to the end of that budget process, uh, but there is there's certainly still time um, should the committee wish to, to do that between now and their next meeting or at their next meeting. Awesome. Thank you, Annie. So, Mr. Chair, maybe uh, we can uh, work with Annie to, to see the next agenda, um, how something might be placed there in terms of the connection between the committee and the budget planning process. Certainly, we can work on that. And Thank Jackie, you. are you here? Jackie, still. Okay. I, I... I asked Jackie because my computer is barking at me. So if I, uh, if the chair falls, then you have to take over for me. Uh, Kristen, do you have anything? Yeah, um, I just wanted to kind of um, jump on Rochelle's point. Um, and Councillor Russell, I think you made a really good point that I'm actually excited about. Um, so if one of the purpose of our committee is to kind of look forward and do better, um, you know, if we've missed the ball, unfortunately, with um, applying a diversity and equity lens to the budget process and to actually the pieces that staff are recommending to council, um, I'm wondering if that's something that we can look at as a committee, because um, if we're kind of thinking of how do we do this better, um, you know, the recommendation that staff are bringing forward shouldn't disproportionately affect disabled Halifax or like residents of Halifax like it is right now. So we're looking to the future and like, what can we do like a policy wise um, or help to inform the future decisions? Um, can we look at applying, is it a lens tool that exists or different recommendations so that when staff are actually looking for budget items to bring forward to council, they actually take a bit of um, a lens approach into that thought process before it even gets to council for a decision. Councillor Russell, would you like to respond? Absolutely, the timing on that would be amazing. Um, we are, we have, now that we have a schedule, uh, yes, the next meeting of this committee is uh, March 20. The, uh, I, I talked about the items on that list that Rochelle was worried about moving to the budget adjustment list. We, the budget committee, are going to be talking about that budget adjustment list on March 29. So uh, we would be able to um, broadcast uh, within the committee and uh, uh, I suspect more widely, the items that will be on that budget adjustment list for consideration uh, in time for the next meeting on March 20, so that we can develop that letter for March 29. That works out quite well. Does that Those. work for us, yeah. Annie? Do we add that discussion item to the agenda for our March 20 meeting? Thank you, Chair. Absolutely. I, I think I have received a great direction from the committee today on what folks are looking for uh, for that meeting. And um, my thought would be that, you know, this will be an agenda item for the next meeting. And with that, I will circulate the document that outlines um, kind of where the um, potential reductions within the current budget process are listed so that um, committee has so that the committee has that information uh, going into the meeting on the 20th. Excellent. Kristen, is your hand still raised or is that from the previous that's my failure of uh technology so no i'm good thank you oh, okay just checking and if so we with, uh, in... Councilor russell thank you if we do not have finance staff who are able to address uh that budget adjustment list at the meeting i can certainly take care of 
that. Thank you very much for that volunteer, Councillor Russell. Do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? This is Rochelle. I will motion to adjourn. Thank you, Rochelle. And thank you. Thank you for having this discussion. I interrupted somebody. Oh, it was Michelle here. I'm I'm finally home. Yay. Um, I said I could second it. I didn't know if you do a seconder or not. Uh, not for this one, but thank you for your input. Okay. And I'm glad you made it home safely. Yes, thank you. And thank you for letting me contribute in my car ride. I appreciate that. Thank you Whoever very much. Me, thank you. <laughs> You're very welcome. So a motion has been put forward to adjourn. So I will call this meeting to an end at 5.54 p.m. Thank you, everyone, for your attendance. And I will see you all, hopefully, on March 20th. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye, folks. Bye-bye.